customary zhuzhing of the hair. I like, like your hair. eyes today. Thank you. I spent a long time on them to make them symmetrical. Well, they're Somebody cool. Somebody this. Thank you. <laughs> Hello everybody, Chalon here, and today I am back with one of my favorite magic people. This is Aiden Walker, and we had an interview more than a year ago about his book, Six Ways. The first way to go to kind of think about spirits is to realize that they are not necessarily super different than you are. If you treat yourself more like a spirit being, you can get more done magically. Uh, and then if you treat them more in the way that you would like to be treated as a person, they tend to reciprocate a lot harder. If there was a new witch coming to me, I would be like, this is a book that you absolutely must have. I recommend it all the time. I think anybody who's interested in magic, just any sort of practical magic, should buy this book, read it, actually do the exercises in the book, and I've actually done the exercises as well, and they're amazing. So it is such a pleasure that Aiden is back to talk about magic again and also, exciting, exciting, he has a class coming up. It's called Building the Bones and it's starting in, is it two weeks? It's just about, yeah, about two weeks. About two the weeks. The 2nd of February. So I, I do have the book as a required reading for it, but mostly as background. And there are some exercises that are shared that way. The exercises and the thought processes that were inspired by Six Ways, your book. I mean, it changed the way that I think about magic. And now you're saying that this course, there's going to be new material, things that aren't in the book. Right. Yeah, I didn't, I, it didn't make sense for me to teach straight from the book. So building the bones was like, what is the most, what can you give somebody in eight weeks that they could then run with? in actually a more directed fashion than Six Ways. So one of the things that I found really inspiring about Six Ways is before I read this book, I was having a really hard time reconciling my lack of belief mm -hmm. in magic with the idea of magic. So for those of you who may not be aware, I am an atheist witch. I've been a flagrant atheist all my life. I've softened my stance, partly in thanks to this book, um, but after reading your book and there was, I can't remember the exact line, but the basic idea was that you can hold many different, sometimes totally disparate beliefs at the same time. Right. Can you talk a little bit more about magic as a practical thing, magic as something that you can use in the real world? Sure. I mean, to me, it's, it's like any other kind of skill or talent set, right? That. I think it's innate to us as a possibility. It's like accepting, <laughs> what's the best term? We, what, let's make up a term for it. Kind of like maybe like a subset of physics almost that magic ties into. And it's not in a mathematical sense, but that this is, if this is a part of reality, which is my experience of it, then you should be able to interact with it just like you can other aspects of reality. Um, so like we know that like music moves people, but different music moves different people, right? And so same thing. I think that magic is effective, but different magic is effective for different people. Um, so I don't think that kind of belief in some religious structure in particular, because I think that that's super, super recent. That's like the last 10 minutes of our existence as, as people, as I think of it. Um, and so why would I attach myself to that? Uh, if what I'm looking at is, you know, at most, maybe the last five or 6,000 years of human history is what we have turned into the religions we have now. But we know we've been pretty much like this for like 150,000 years at the very, very least. So why is that last few minutes so important of that day, if we kind of view our history as a day? And what exactly is your angle, um, if it's not, you know, devotional, like religious magic or because there's so many different types of magic, but you have a very right. specific sort of, I, I'm going to call it like a genre, you know, <laughs> a specific genre that you seem drawn to and that I personally have found myself more and more drawn to. Can you talk a little bit more about animism? Animism is kind of, 
it's like this is like anything else. So we could find like academic definitions of animism, and I don't care because it's like I'm not doing this as an academic practice. To me, animism is the idea that most things could be engaged with as if they were kind of like people. My little bobcat skull. Yeah, totally. There's somebody in there. And uh, I can talk to that person now because we've had many years together. And so animism opens up this door to getting assistance and getting information from non-human sources uh, just by being open to the idea that I could go outside and, with the intention of finding help for something, for a problem. And if I've kind of developed the sensitivity a little bit, then I might find that that is a stone or that that is a piece of wood or a tree or something that I could go, hey, I have this going on. Could we enter into a relationship and could I get your help with it? I'm sure a lot of people are going to be like, that sounds like hippie stuff. You know, it is like, hippie stuff. It totally yeah. is. <laughs> what I'm trying to have people understand, hopefully, through my videos, is that there is value, even for somebody like me, an atheist who's just like, whatever, um, to find that there's relations and help that can be found in what you call, and you have a specific term for that, it's like, the field, the allies, and the other. So it's not just right. your mom and your next door neighbor. There's an invisible field that can help. The field to me is is just everything that is happening and everything that could happen, right? So it's potential and actual, right? Um, reality. And so I think that that, which is kind of backed up by some kinds of science, we look at some of the quantum entanglement issues or the idea that what we observe is changed by our observation of it. But that's the field that's being engaged with, right? So I look at prayer, I look at magic, I look at devotional work, I look at making offerings to spirits, all is that attempt to engage with that field. It doesn't matter to me at all if you think that you can engage with the spirits, but it's worth it acting as if you can and seeing what comes from it and what comes from it doesn't even have to change that experience for you uh, the fact that if you set up an altar or a shrine or something and burn candles to a particular energy or a particular spirit if that works for you and you get what you want out of it why does it matter whether that's real. Somebody uh, sent me a really nasty email, which was really funny because they were like, I think this is all placebo effect. And I said, but the thing that's funny is that the placebo effect is real. People actually get the benefit from the thing that wasn't active, right? Biologically. I hear what you're saying, but it's unimportant from a practitioner standpoint. For me, there's something very real about uh, working with kind of bones, stones. My thing is you know, that end of things, uh, dirt. But I'm not really concerned whether what I'm experiencing is 100% externally true or is simply how the field is talking to me. It's using my own internal language to present me with information. Which of these things it is isn't super important. I believe that I'm dealing with external entities and I have good reason, I think, to believe that after 30 years of this, but I'm not sure that that's important to the practice of magic. I'm not a big fan of Aleister Crowley at all, but he said a great thing in Libra O he said, where he said, um, if certain actions are performed, certain results follow, right? This is basic empiricism. And so that's my approach to all of these practices is like, if it seems like it might work, do it for long enough to see, which is usually not do it once. It's usually do it for a long period of time. Uh, but understand that you don't have to believe in the story behind it. It's often just the practices that work. And this is what attracted to me about chaos magic in the early days, uh, was there's all of the story coming from ceremonial magic, which was kind of my first real contact, that I didn't really buy. And the chaos magic kind of said, well, that's okay. You don't really have to buy it. You just have to do that thing. Uh, you have to not actively be working against yourself by saying, I don't believe this as I'm doing it. Like, drop that. It doesn't matter. Who cares? Uh, and see what happens. See if it works. That's one of the big takeaways that I got from your book, Six Ways. The, the idea of utility. 
that magic can be utilitarian. Because usually the way that people frame magic is that you're special if you do magic and you're a priestess or like a warlock or you know what I mean? Like you're not just some person who's doing their taxes. You know, right. You're, totally. You're separate from everyday life. And that may be part of the appeal of the resurgence of witchcraft and magic. Um, but what you're talking about is something that I was able to integrate in my everyday atheist life. And the fact that you were able to, you know, articulate so well in the book that I just see it as a type of tool and a mindset and you can drop it as soon as you do something else. But, you know, while you're doing it, just give it your best shot and see what happens. Yeah, totally. You know, that's totally. scientific uh, method 101 right there. There's a reason why I think magic in general kind of gets slagged with overly hippie or kind of overly woo-woo things, right? My practice can get pretty woo uh, from an outside perspective. And we may have talked about this the last time that we talked, but I'm also the person, I mean, there's fruit and candles and monster energy drinks and gummy bears and root bear barrels because I was in Walmart and they wanted the root bear barrels. This isn't always fancy stuff. This isn't, again, because I'm not religious, I'm not trying to like get that sense of the holiness of what I'm doing. That's unrelated. Like I'm often in here going, I don't want to get audited because last time that happened, that sucked. So let's not do that. This year. <laughs> um, and I'm doing it like that. I'm not coming up with some fancy way of saying this. Like I, that's to me, part of it is, can you be honest in what you're doing and sincere in what you're doing, which involves you being you. And for some people, this will be super flowery. Uh, you know, but sometimes it's not. And for a lot of us, I think that that's, that is one of the keys to opening it up. If we look at like a lot of these books of magic, even mine in some ways will have language that doesn't resonate with us. Uh, but I think, you know, I always try to be clear, like change it. It doesn't matter. Like look at what are the key points that you're trying to hit and put it in your own words. It just doesn't matter uh, because it's about communication. It's about relationship with the field and the others. Uh, or your deep mind, whatever you're comfortable with, uh, wearing the face of the field and the others. What exactly is the field, the allies and the others, you know, in your experience? In my experience, the field is just everything that, as I said before, I think that that is manifest and unmanifest, but so it's the potential. Because part of the interest in magic, I think, is bringing about things that don't quite make sense in a normal scientific materialist causal chain, right? Like, I shouldn't be able to do a spell to get a better deal on the car that I sell, right? Because there's no way for me to actually influence that, right? How, unless I'm doing some, like, NLP to the guy on the spot or something, right? And actually trying to, like, mess with his head, uh, which I'm not into. But, uh, and yet it, can ha it frequently works. Uh, and so there's some other kind of causal chain going on. And so the field is everything that we could possibly touch. And it's important that that include things that aren't present, which is why the unmanifest parts in there. And then the allies are any of the spirit allies and the others. Uh, the others are basically all of the apparently non human or non incarnate kind of spirits or powers that we can deal with. And the allies are the part of that crew that are attached to us and have our backs. So all of the others don't have our backs. All of the allies, by definition, have our backs. And so we don't feed the others when we're making offerings. We feed the allies. Uh, and hopefully that lures some more folks in to come and play with us. They go, oh, this is pretty cool. He buys us candy and energy drinks and feeds us candles and stuff that we like. And I think a lot of people, they get hung up on this idea of, okay, maybe they do believe that there are spirits, especially ancestral spirits. Like, oh, but, you know, I have to be, like, timid in front of them. I have to, like, bow down in front of all their power. What if the spirits get pissed off at them? The spirits will curse them and their family for 10,000 years and stuff. Mm -hmm. so, oh, I think it is a legit worry. And it's unfortunately generally overblown. But it's but there's also some truth to it, right? So it can be kind of new aged away uh, that you can cross lines. It's funny. I was having some problems. Now it must be five years ago. 
And uh, I went to Andrew McGregor, who, you know, who runs yeah. the Hermit Slam. I know that you said it's about a feel, it's about this vibe that you get, but let's say you're not at that point yet. Mm -hmm. You know, like, how do you yeah. know? So I think that accepting that you don't know, right? And accepting that you can't know necessarily right away what it means. You know, I, uh, I, I've, I've had that thought myself, oh, it's a sign. Um, and kind of the place that I got to with that, which I really think is super balanced for people, is to have this idea that like, well, if this is meaningful, I will, I will know what that meaning is at some point in a way that I completely cannot deny it. And I uh, had him do some readings for me. And uh, he was great. And he said, you know, you have a bunch of ancestors that really don't like your practice. Uh, and he said, and so I think you should basically buy them off. You should make offerings to them to get out of your way. And that is my close-in ancestral practice because there is a lot of resistance from my close-in dead. Um, my grandmothers are cool. My grandfathers are not. The great grandfathers are not cool at all. So I do enough offering work to keep them pacified and keep them out of my way. Uh, and then I work with the ancestors that are way, way, way deep line. And so there is that that goes on. And so a lot of times people don't realize that they have, this is kind of a hard one to talk about without kind of throwing people that have issues with kind of reincarnation concepts. So if we don't think about it as reincarnation, but we think about it as being bloodline, perhaps, that makes it a little bit easier. So let's say that we could use my family as an example. So part of my family was Mayflower people that came over with the Puritans. Uh, so if I think about that, tied into this kind of animistic spirit model, they were probably not popular at all with the people who lived here in this country. Uh, and probably were heavily involved in all of the shit that was done to that. And this can kind of produce, if we believe in the ancestors and we believe in that connection, these connections to things that work against us. Uh, we can do this if we move into houses, you know, there's bad houses uh, that are mostly about bad things that happened in houses, right? So you living in the city where we rent a lot, things like that. So whatever the people before you really had like an incredibly hateful, loveless relationship and were in that apartment for 30 years, coming from kind of the spirit model, isn't it likely that that attracted to some stuff to that house that is bonded to that house until you do something about it? And so in the class, that's kind of where we go is how do we sever these things that are close to us, strip off those bad attachments, keep our personal state base clear. Uh, and do the work so that we're not kind of being of interest to the stuff that's not helpful and being super kind of sexy and interesting to the things that want to help us out. Yeah, I've noticed that there's eight modules that you're going to teach, and it seems very holistic. So it's not just going to be like, how to summon a demon? You know, it's not like no. as focused as that, but it's not a general survey either. You make that very clear. Right. And so I wanted to read off some of these modules. Right. And the first one is clarity. Clarity work is just about having enough sense of ourselves in a real and accurate way that I know where I'm fucked up and I know where I'm right on and I'm not giving in and feeding the fucked up side or allowing that to influence my magic. So that guy hates my book and fucking talks shit about it on my, wherever. Why do I care? That has nothing to do with me. He bought the wrong book, right? It didn't serve him. No problem. Um, but I could get crazy about it, right? I could end up all anxious about it. I could be trying to figure out what did I do wrong? Why did he not get that? Or I could go, I have anger issues that are, that I'm unwilling to resolve. Right. I'm unwilling to kind of note, oh, I get angry a lot about things that are perhaps not justifiable. <laughs> or I get angry a lot at things that are justifiable, but still nothing good comes from it. 
Like there's no benefit. Um, so clarity work is about that. It's like, how do we kind of look at that stuff in a way that we can see it and then not feed it, especially magically? Because you don't want to go, okay, I have anger issues and now that's going to be a quarter of my magic. What does that do to who hangs out with you? Now you have, because my take on this is if that's your regular state a lot of the time, you have allies that help you with that. They help you to be angry all the time because it serves them. Uh, it's like having the friend that you exist for them to tear down so they can feel better about themselves. I just want to it underline doesn't... that part. I just want to underline that part because I think a lot of people are going to be like, what? You know, there's spirits around me that are basically kind of egging me on to like, yell at my kids all the time. Absolutely. And especially if we look at it now, you know, you and I were talking about political stuff beforehand, but if we think about that as kind of an overall cultural gestalt, look at what goes on as far as kind of the intelligence in general of communication right now. We have these kind of, we could think of them as kind of like anger or rage spirits. And what is the justification that allows that to be cool? Well, it's that my anger is righteous. It's that I'm justified. I don't care if I'm justified. Does it serve me or does it not? And as a magician, if it doesn't serve me, it's got to go. That's totally different from what I think a lot of people would consider to be magic. You know, we're thinking a lot of times that magic are external tools that are going to, I don't know, like tell you what to do. What you're talking about is a type of self-awareness that Sounds almost more like a psychological technique mm -hmm. rather. So what's the difference between like a psychological tool versus a magical tool? Well, it's interesting because I'm heavily influenced by some uh, Buddhist psychology texts. Uh, there's two of them, I think, referenced in six ways uh, in this recommended reading. And what they talk about is a pretty, uh, so I'll just look at that. And I am not a Buddhist, so I can't be, don't quote me as the source for, uh, or uh, even a reasonable explanation of this, but this is how I read this. And they say that the mind essentially is the storehouse of all the seeds, right? In this uh, Buddhist parable uh, or teaching, and that there's seeds for the things that are good for us, and there's the seeds that are the things that are bad for us. And kind of our job in getting our minds together is to not water the seeds that are bad for us or hinder us, as my thinking, or are unhelpful, and to water the things that are helpful. And to me, this is kind of super baseline magical work. It's like, yes, it's a psychological view, but there's no way for that kind of mindset to not influence both what we do magically consciously and unconsciously. And a huge part of magic for me is how do we stop doing what I would think of as the bad magic, which is the unhelpful stuff unconsciously. Like I want to choose everything that I ask for. Uh, and it has to serve my overall purpose. So there's shit that I absolutely would love to go off on that I won't because it actually doesn't benefit my goals. Uh, I don't care if it's right or if I'm justified or if it's a righteous position. Does it help me get where I want to go? Yeah, I'm totally justified. That person tried to fuck me over. I don't care because I can't afford to care because that's energy that is being taken away from my goals and my interests. I'm not looking for a resolution about my anger. I'm looking to be aware of it and to decide what to do with it as a magical act. You talk a lot about building energy and directing that energy and the way that you talk about magic. It has a lot to do with energy, which yep. makes a lot of sense to see magic as energy, chi, whatever you want to call it. Totally. Some other modules that you have, power line, breath work, and I'm guessing those are all to help you kind of build that magic energy. Yep. Um, the breath work is also a really great way to trick people into doing clarity work. Breathwork is easy, breathwork feels good, and it has the effect of making you aware of what's going on. Uh, one of the things that I had to really kind of question here was like, do I suggest a meditation practice? And meditation really messes with a lot of folks. 
And I think you can kind of backdoor into meditation using breath work. Uh, you don't have to actually just sit there and try and watch everything. You can actually be doing some stuff that helps, as we said, kind of power generation and clearing work that will have maybe not the same effect, but a very beneficial effect on our ability to perceive what's going on. This is one of the things you say, that magic is our natural state. And so it sounds totally. like this course is just taking away all the bullshit, so you can actually be who you actually are, fundamentally, which is a magical person. Right. And you said, uh, quote, if we can stay there in the natural state, then we operate smoothly in a magical world. Right. I know a lot of people are going to be like, it don't feel like a magical world. I don't feel right. like I live in a magical world. I go and try to do magic because I want to be in a magical world. So what does that even mean? And so that kind of natural state is not that we're now in Harry Potter world and we can fly and we can shoot lightning out of our fingertips. So that would be cool. Um, it's just a way, it's just realizing that we can influence what's going on for us way more than we think a lot of the time. And that there's very slow ways, so we could kind of go back to psychology, where if we're looking at Western psychology, we could be going and doing our regular work with our therapist, which is often really necessary for people who are so jacked up in general. But there's kind of a way that we can radically influence that kind of personal health state, which then allows us to make better choices and realize, like, oh, yeah, I am shitty to my kids when I don't get enough sleep. Is that all me or does something else come on board? And can, even if it's, even if I'm not viewing a spirit model, even if I'm viewing kind of a psychological model of magic, can I work with that? I am super grumpy and pissed off when I'm tired as if it's a spirit that I can engage with. This is kind of what Ramsey Dukes talks about in um, his little book of demons, right? that there's a benefit to, from a magical perspective, of being able to personify kind of our flaws and our de defects, because then we can direct, direct them directly, right? So you go, okay, I didn't sleep enough. I already am grumpy when I get up. I'm still grumpy after the coffee. Maybe I can go do a little bit of magic to change that so that it doesn't have as much of an effect on my day, which could be anything from kind of minor to catastrophic, right? And so it's not about, to me, it's not about living in kind of fantasy world. Um, it's about influencing both ourselves to operate better in this world and then influencing the world to operate more in a more friendly fashion with us. You know, to talk more about the modules. So we talked about clarity, the power line, the breath work. Of course, there's like the, what we think of magic as being like healing and blessings, you know, and also boundaries, protection. Mm -hmm. and cauldron and cord. What are all these? <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's interesting, and one thing that I'll throw out is that these aren't actually particularly specific to individual classes. There are eight classes, and there are eight areas covered here, but really these things are deeply interrelated. But I needed a framework so that I didn't just do everything that one could do in a course. Healing and blessing work is both healing ourselves from kind of our damage and our trauma, because we all got it, and then also kind of that thing we were dealing with earlier, how do we kind of break some of those ancestral line issues? Uh, some people, again, might view this as past life issues. I tend to view it as just like ancestors. They were people too. They had their issues. And some of those probably persist and get passed down the line. And some of that stuff is just to be really clear is not uh, at all woo. Okay. So like in my case, we found out, uh, when I was probably 30, that there was a great, great grandparent who was sexually abusive in one side of the family. And so all of his kids were affected by that. And I'll talk about this only now because they're all gone. That's like this present trauma that you can view as not having any kind of spirit aspect to it, right? It's just that those kids got jacked up in a particular way that they then passed on to their kids. They weren't abusive to them, but they may have been more distant. They may have had particular fears, particular concerns that didn't really help everybody to be healthy all the way down the chain, right? So that's one of the things that I became aware of at that point is like, oh, I probably have to do work to clear that influence. And one of my basic kind of concepts about magic is if you have a 
kind of persistent influencer energy that lasts for long enough, it operates like a spirit, which is really beneficial. It's bad because it's doing its own thing and it's trying to get you involved, right? It's trying to, to keep you playing that game. But the good part, and this is what Ramsey Dukes talks about in that book, is we can then actually tr treat it as an external thing. We can go, okay, you are no longer having any influence, and here's the deal. Uh, I will buy you off. This is usually my approach. It's like, I will give you like the king of offerings, and then after that, if you come back, I will destroy you. And usually they leave, because usually they go, okay, I'm not interested in actually that side of it, and this is pretty cool. Yeah. So healing and blessing deals with both that side of it and then a lot of the stuff that I talk about in six ways as being energy leaks. Like functionally in our energy bodies, most of us are, are have holes or is the way that I view it. And again, this is all metaphor and doesn't need to be taken particularly seriously. If it sounds just crazy woo, just view it as a way of talking about something that's not easy to perceive. And so some of this work is just how do we raise up enough energy and then allow that to heal the system. It's kind of like you get sick, and if you don't have enough nutrition coming in, it's harder to heal, right? Or you break a limb, but if you're badly malnourished, that's probably not going to heal real well. Whereas if we can kind of flood the system with nutrition, that's pretty awesome. That'll work very well. The cauldron and cord work is, uh, <laughs> that's the piece the allies were like, we're teaching this. That's the main thing that they kind of came in and said, I, you, you weren't thinking about this, but you're teaching this. And it's a bunch of practices that are tied into tapping into those very deep line ancestral currents as a source of power. So this doesn't, this isn't, we're not talking grandparents, great grandparents. We're not talking anyone in living memory. We're really not even talking anything that is going to differentiate as a person anymore. Uh, it's like a massive just current that's pushing us out, right? We manifested because of this. We think about ancestors and we think about the people that we knew, right? Or that we heard stories about. But if you look at that little breakdown and you go, okay, so you had two parents. And they each had two parents. So you have four grandparents. And this doubles every step back, right? So you get whatever that is, 8, then 16, then 32, then 64, then 128, then 256. If we view a generation as 20 years, and we just go super simple, something most people will accept as modern humans as being 70,000 years old, that's 3,500 generations. So with that doubling all the way back, how many ancestors do you have? You have an innumerable volume of ancestors and it doesn't really matter whether they were good people or bad people the fact that you're here means that this is this massive energy current that it has manifested as you and cauldron and cord work is tapping into that but it also sounds like we're going to have to do a lot of these things it's not just going to be like oh we're going to get this information a nice pdf and that's it no there's a lot of uh, guided meditation work that is intended to get someone started in the work um, and then get them kind of connected enough to the work and being able to drop into that space. For me, with kind of the cauldron and cord work, I've been doing this work consistently for 10 years now. Um, it took a couple years for it to really kick up. Like I could feel benefit, but it changed after a couple of years. Like a couple of years in, they were like, okay, you're serious. And that's what's kind of the part that is super woo for me is that if you kind of keep your practices consistent enough for long enough, something shows up. And this has been a consistent experience for me. And again, I'm not claiming what that thing really is. For me, they appear as independent spirits. And at that point, things get very interesting because you can actually have a conversation with kind of that ancestral wave in a sense. You like can't literally be like, nothing kind of like a magical that. person, like a perfect mage and like a monk. Oh my God. Yeah, no, 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 no. Like, yeah, and it's funny. I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about when we were talking is I think that there's a view, and I'm not sure it comes from kind of, I think it comes from both feudal states, uh, with, you know, in the West at least, and then into kind of corporate culture, which are very similar, and then into kind of video games 
culture. I can see this change where we really have uh, adopted the concept of uh, information as hierarchy as power, which I think is really wrong. I think it's just provably wrong from a magical side because there's people who just don't know shit. <laughs> They've never read any of the books. And if they look at you wrong, your life goes to shit. <laughs> and anybody that's really been around this stuff for a long time knows that these people are out there. Uh, and so, you go, so that's not about information. It's not about study. It's about they're tapped in in a way that allows that to go on, right? We see this with healers. We see somebody that, for whatever reason, took a Tai Chi class and now can do crazy shit to your energy body. Like they didn't study that stuff necessarily. It's not about that kind of information load. So I don't think that the hierarchical view even makes any sense. So no, you don't like learn this stuff and now you're a badass. It's like you get into the practice and it's like playing music. I think about magic most commonly because I, I particularly like the kind of blues and rock and roll world. I think it really about like blues. It's a few scale patterns in most of what we listen to, right? There's only a few keys that generally get used. It's mostly guitar-driven is the stuff I listen to. So why are some people able to do just crushing things with that tool? It's not because they leveled up. They didn't climb that corporate ladder. They didn't become the king of something. They're no longer, they didn't cease to be a normal person. They just tapped into that current and were able to use what they learned to make something amazing. And to me, that's how magic works. So it's like, I don't think you need much. And this is one of the reasons that I don't read a lot on magic anymore. You, you need some tools that you get good at. Uh, and so this kind of course is really functionally like, what's the most concise toolkit I could produce and actually teach in a short period of time? A lot of musical prodigies, you know, they've been accused historically of selling their soul to the devil. Totally. You do the practice, not because you're trying to like build yourself up to become like a quote unquote better person, but you're doing the practice so you become more aware so you can strip away the bullshit so you can be the person you actually are. That's part of the issue in the West, at least, is that we are so armored that we can't sense anymore, right? Uh, and this could be the emotional pain of other people or our own emotional pain, right? Because if we think about, I, you think about like, uh, I, I just have the, the guy's version of this, you know, suck it up. Don't be a pussy. Boys don't cry. All of that stuff, right? And you think about the people that, utterly are broken by trying to manifest that, right? So this side of it is like, no, you are a badass, but it's coded. You've got kind of layers of kind of spiritual and cultural indoctrination that are counter to this thing that to me is very natural. And so a lot of my, you know, when the, the, the course got jumped by the allies to the forefront, but the next book is heavily about how do we undo that cultural indoctrination using magical means. Not like we need to dive into it and look at it and learn it and figure out the causes, because those don't really matter. It's how do we step outside of it? Because that's the way easier way. It doesn't mean you don't deal with your shit, but there's a point that standing on the train tracks and getting hit by the train because you think you've got to go through it is totally wrong. It's like, well, what if you go six feet to the left and just watch that train go by a few times and see what you learn about it and to see if there's something, if those tracks are even interesting uh, and if that train is even interesting. Even if like later on you're just like, actually, I really want to summon demons. Well, if you take this course first, then you're going to be more in that state to be more successful at whatever sort of distinctive magic path that you decide to take later on. So this is Absolutely, because kind of, yeah, you're going to be less. It's kind of like um, 
you know, some of it's in that view, it's like situational awareness, right? Because we think about the people who get really messed up by certain kinds of magic. Uh, it is usually because they have no situational awareness at all. All they see is I want to get back at that person. I want to get in that person's pants, right? But it's coming from a place of no self-knowledge. And you can totally do a, do effective <laughs> magic from that place of no self-knowledge. But if you had some self-knowledge and if you had kind of that foundation built up, A, it would work better, and B, you might make way better decisions about where you're going to put that energy. Uh, so it's like you got a toolkit. Do you start on the roof of the house? Well, how are you going to get it up there after you build the walls? This is a lot of what I see is let's start uh, at the bottom. Let's, let's build a really strong foundation. And maybe you don't need anything more than a, a candle and a sigil. Uh, maybe you do, but this still is going to assist that down the road. One of the things that I think is important to stress here is that there is going to be a lot of practice in this course. And this goes yep. back to this, <laughs> when you were talking about the corporate world and things like that, it's, um, you know, the sort of like over the weekend, you can, you can become the most effective manager, you know, in the history of managerial, whatever history, this idea that it only takes like, I don't know, like a weekend, you, have, you just have to take like a Tony Robbins course and then you're going to be fine. And there was an article recently in the independent about, uh, she's actually a book critic. She was like, I spent a week learning how to become a witch and the results were problematic. I understand why people kind of latch into specific views of magic as identity and that I understand why it happens, but I don't really understand the attraction to it because if you are one thing that is super nameable, well, then it actually matters what people apply that name to, right? Whereas if you're just you and you do that thing, right? You do some magic, you do witchcraft, those things don't matter. Identity by nature can be incredibly fluid. And this is one of those tools that we deal with a little bit in, in, in this course, and it will be dealt with very heavily in a later one. But if we realize that the identity is not really who we are that it's something that we have kind of it's like um is accreation the term like when you when like a, uh i think it's barnacles and stuff build their shells in place like can be totally missing the animal but where uh the identity is kind of uh drawn to us and then we kind of calcify it and this is kind of a wretched thing from a magical perspective because then we are that thing being that thing is not necessarily always helpful. So what if we instead go, I am this person who right now is presenting as this. Uh, I'm this being that is presenting as this. But my identity could change. And if my identity changes, what else changes? And usually what changes is our ability to see different options. I'm not really interested in knowing where I stand if it's always going to be the same place. I want to be able to stand in different places and function well. And so again, it's a, it's a funny thing to me because to me, I go like, why is, why is your identity so calcified around that thing that you get buttered uh, when somebody stupid or says something stupid about it? Why is that relevant? What's the benefit? What are you gaining from that attachment to that thing? One of the things that's talked about in six ways and that I recommend is this scraping practice where we scrape off attachments, right? And every month or so, somebody emails me or contacts me and says, so how do I know which attachments I'm scraping off? I'm like, I don't think it matters. It's like, scrape them all off because you'll reattach the things that matter. You'll reconnect to the things that matter. The course name is Building the Bones, but the type of bones that you're talking about is not the calcified bones, but it's more like this like very dynamic, I almost see it as like the structure that's like flexible, but strong, like bamboo, you know, can bend. Totally. And I think that's one of the reasons why like the book, when I read it, it was a revelation to me. We're not going to become fixed on this identity and therefore this concept of, do you really need to believe in magic? Right. It's irrelevant. 
absolutely irrelevant because sometimes an identity you have does believe and other identities don't. You're moving in and out of it. A lot of people are going to be like, I want to do magic, but I don't think I'm worthy because I don't believe in it. I have to really believe in magic for it to work, but I just don't. Actually, I don't think it's about the belief. It's about the actual practice. When I started with magic, I had reason to believe that it worked because I was dealing with possession experiences. And then as I kind of began doing more ceremonial magic, I had to come up with an approach that I could work with because I didn't buy the story uh, that I was kind of given. It didn't make sense to me. And a lot of what was being, what I was being told is you have to either fake it till you make it, you have to believe, all of this stuff. And I went, no. If this works, it's got to be a little closer to just regular reality. Like, if I learn how to tune the guitar and I learn some scales, there's a potential that I could play some music, right? Uh, even if I don't learn the scales, if I'm willing to sit with that thing, it's likely I'm going to come across them, right? Because they're kind of inherent in the thing. And I think magic is the same way. So I, I think non-belief can be a problem in the moment. So being a skeptic while you're doing work is a problem. And especially if you're doing long-term work, you kind of have to learn how to do that suspension of disbelief like you do watching a Star Wars movie, right? Uh, where you go, okay, I am going to get this out up front. I don't know if I buy this. I don't know if I buy that it's real, but I'm not going to have this conversation around the work I'm doing. And I'm not going to then go also go back to my journal and journal about how I don't think it's working, right? This also ties into that concept that's in the book is about falling in love, right? Part of falling in love is choosing to not notice a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> it's beneficial in that situation uh, for that effect, right? And again, if we want to fall out of love, all we have to do is change what we focus take on. Take off the glasses. <laughs> the yeah, take off the glasses and go, okay, what is everything I hate about this person? What, what annoys me about this person? I'm not going to like cave to the things that I find just super compelling. Um, and so we kind of have to do the same thing in magic, which is we just have to get out of the way and do the work uh, and not be too concerned about whether it looks stupid or whether we buy it, it's like, you don't have to buy it. Just do the work, do the sigils, do the meditations, do the guided work. Uh, if the deal is you get crazy and you go out and buy dirt from the cemetery and you do that, do that as sincerely as you possibly can. Even if all you can do is kind of like shut that side of you that goes, this is crazy and lock it at home and give it a place, you know, put it in an orange. Go, this is my skepticism, and during the course of this thing, I'm putting it in this orange. I'm putting the orange in a drawer. And I don't have to deal with it now. It's in a drawer. You know, and that's really the key, is how do we have, we don't need faith, we just need to not be in our way. I love that. You don't need faith. You just need to get out of your way, do the actual work, and just see what the results are. Because I think empiricism and kind of, it, it, it's one of the things I talk about in the, in the class, is like, that this is purely experiential work. I'm going to give you my stories because they're relevant to what I experience, and that's all I can share. I can fake this objectivity and kind of deny the stories and come up with a bunch of bullshit uh, explanations that sound more reasonable, but I think that that doesn't help. But if I can be clear, like, this is the story. It's a, a mythology. Uh, there's no reason for even me to take it 100% as true. It's just the story. So that story then allows the work to happen within a particular context, and then someone will go, oh, that story doesn't quite work for me, but what I'm getting is this. And that's the first communication with the spirits, usually, is where you go, you're running this thing. And this is where I think people can get really messed up within kind of dogmatic systems, is because that they'll actually get something that is kind of metaphorically true for them, and they're told to disregard it because it doesn't fit the dogma of the tradition. Uh, and that's kind of an awful thing because your allies just tried to talk to you, uh, is how I view it. They just said, we're interested in playing. And your belief that it had to happen in a particular way, you said, no, not interested. Doesn't fit my viewpoint. Like, well, that's shitty. Uh, 
And this is one of the things we kind of have to get beyond, I think, as magicians. There's shit that I do now that are still kind of really big leaps that I still have to have this conversation. And so I really will. I mean, I am the guy that would go, this is my skepticism about believing I could make my life like this. And I'm going to go put it in this orange and bury it in the backyard. It's a purely metaphorical, magical act. And it will give me the space to then do the work to see if I actually can pull that off. To me, this course, it just sounds like such an important foundational course for anyone who wants to do magic, or not even just magic, but let's say that you're into law of attraction. Get out totally. of your way. When we say get out of your way, ego, get out of the way. Right. So that who you are actually authentically, and I think we all know deep down, who we are authentically is like so powerful. It is not in the interest of the powers that be culturally that everybody be tapped into that. And so the things have become structured so that we aren't. And so a lot of this work to me is also about that. It's like, let's just become functional. Uh, we don't have to become, you know, grand wizard. Uh, let's become totally functional and be aware that we can influence things, even if those things are just ourselves. Again, if we want to view it as a psychological process, that's monstrously powerful. Course is going to start, like you mentioned, is it February 2nd? Yeah, registration closes January 31st of 2020, in case you're seeing this some other year. And uh, the course starts on February 2nd. And it's eight weeks? It's eight weeks. Uh, generally, what you're looking at is uh, somewhere between an hour and a half and two and a half hours of audio downloads. Uh, that are guided. It is all happening on Facebook, so I'm sorry for those that aren't on Facebook. Go create a fake account or something. So and, uh, stuff. it's going to be all audio. So it's all audio, uh, and then interaction in the group. That that's a place where we can kind of troubleshoot, do Q and A. I will be very very hands on in the group. So if somebody, I have some people that have particular dis disabilities that I'm aware of, so I'll be working with those people to work around them. Well, I'm going to link down below. The, the site where you can register for the course. Again, registration closes on the 31st, and the course runs from February 2nd to March 29th. Will you run it again? I don't know. Um, I think probably, but it's probably a year or more out. Uh, I've got three courses that I'm intending to teach, and then I have four books that are in some stage oh of process. <laughs> So it's a little crazy. So I'm not sure when the, the teaching side will come back around. Again, guys, this book, Six Ways, and I think I mentioned this in my previous video interview with Aiden, but I was just touching it, you know? It's like I could be blindfolded and I could be touching my books and I'd be like, oh, this is Six Ways. <laughs> I still don't know why it's like that. It just is. <laughs> yeah, but guys, this is like one of my most annotated, used, and abused lovingly. It wants to be abused. Um, yes, books it likes that it. I have, and I highly, highly recommend if you're unable to take the course to at least get this book, read it, and go through it. I'm still going through it, guys. I'm still stuck on the trance part because me and meditation and trance are not friends. So this is something that you can actually work through, you know, like for a while. I've been working through it for like a year and a half now. So Aiden, thank you so much for spending this time talking to me about building the bones. Well, thank you so much. I mean, it's a total pleasure to get to hang out with you again. Yeah.